And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we are now going to move forward into our next session, which is on cybersecurity and advanced threats. And uh, on the session, we're going to have inputs by Mr. Govind Ramamurthy, who is the CEO and Managing Director at ESCAN. May I request all of you to please join in with a round of applause as we welcome Mr. Govind Ramamurthy. We also have inputs by Mr. Kunal Pandey, who is partner with ITA West with KPMG. Can we all put our hands together and welcome Mr. Kunal Pandey. Our session is also going to have inputs by Mr. Murlidhar Nambiar, who is the Senior Vice President, Cybersecurity, Reserve Bank Information Technology Private Limited. Let's put our hands together and welcome Mr. Nambiar. And to moderate the session, I would request Mr. Patrick Kishore to join us once again. He's the Senior Domain Expert, Institute for Development and Research in Banking Technology. Let's put our hands together and welcome Mr. Kishore on stage once again. Thank you very much for joining us. And with that, over to you, Mr. Kishore. Good evening, everyone. Again, another challenging assignment. The headcount is coming down. And the most important subject in our day-to-day -day lives has been delegated to the last. But still, all is not lost. Today, cybersecurity has become a buzzword. Almost everyone is talking about cybersecurity. From uh, heads of nations, from heads of nations to the man in the street is talking about risks in cybersecurity about uh, how safe his money is in all these newfangled technology. The enemies in this area can be individuals. They could be hacker groups. They could be crime syndicates or even nation states. Attacks could be at a very personal level could be at an organization level or even at a national level. A lot of them are after money. Some of them are after uh, sensitive information, secrets of a country, secrets of, a, of, a, of an institution, and so on. And technology is a great leveler. The crooks know as much technology as the good guys. Right? And they work more hard at it than the good guys. For the good guys, they have a lot of other things to do. For the crooks, that's the only thing they do. So it's a very, very asymmetric warfare between the, the defenders and the attackers. And banks are very, very common targets because that's where the money is. If you hack, uh, let's say... Marathi Motor Company, you can't steal a car. But if you attack a bank, you can steal money. Right? So, banks in India make a lot of effort, spend a lot of money to protect their systems because when a bank is breached, customer's confidence is breached. The entire business of banking is based on trust. So, when we have a whole lot of new technologies coming in to do financial transactions, security becomes very, very important. See, security to be implemented at the device level, at the network level, at the personal level, to the extent that uh, now that we have very, very, very good regulation about uh, customer protection, Reserve Bank of India has recently release some guidelines on customer protection. The onus is more on banking companies, on payment companies and so on to protect the interest of the customers even if he makes a mistake. So in this kind of a scenario, I'll start with Kunal. I'll start with Kunal. What are the kind of risks? See, let's start from the bottom up. Banks, uh, as we all know, have invested heavily into security. What are the risks in wallets? Because all of us, including the latest uh, presentation that has been made, has talked about convenience, ease of use, 
user experience right nothing about security and whereas wallet again the usp of a wallet is ease of use convenience so kunal can you tell us what are the risks in a wallet technology sure. risks sure so uh, yeah uh, you know, let, let's first uh, maybe spend a minute to understand what is a wallet you know uh, wallet actually is a stored value uh, you know account uh, which a wallet provider is offering and most often than not it is being maintained in a mobile phone so therefore we you know we say mobile wallets uh, technically it could be some other wallet also but the way the current uh, mobile penetration is uh, any other form of wallet per se doesn't make sense so uh, the moment we look at wallet we and since we look at mobile and if we look at the uh, you know the digital and the electronics arena the risks come in because of a mobile phone <coughs> now you know one can arguably say that mobile phone is like any other laptop or desktop because it has a, a cpu it has a memory it has a storage it has some software everything is working then what is the difference so the difference you know which comes in and which is where the risks to wallet comes is that uh, mobile phone uh, you know the, the way i look at it it's a device which all of us do everything possible with us to make sure it is on it's 24 by 7 on you know unlike a laptop or a desktop uh, which will shut down for some time maybe when you are sleeping or maybe when you are traveling wallets you'll make sure it's running if the power is coming uh, you know is going down what do you do we search for a power bank and put it into the mobile phone so that's again charging and it's never going to shut down so that's number one it's always on and then you know as uh, uh, patrick was saying that uh, you know from a security perspective you're giving a 24 by 7 by 365 window to a attacker to find out that small 1 second or you know 5 minutes window to try an attack and and breach something so that's number one number two if you look at the risks which come in is because it's always on and because it is your own device it's connected to the internet and i'm talking about here primarily to the uh, you know smartphone uh, devices because wallets per se are in smartphone it's connected to the internet the other thing which is important to understand is that uh, the moment we look at wallet and wallet being stored in smartphones uh, you know i did a I, in one of the other uh, sessions where i was there uh, i did a kind of a poll that in how many you know how many people have a laptop or a desktop at home so maybe if you you know if people can tell me how many of you have a laptop or a desktop at home okay quite quite a few people uh, have that and i'm sure i'm not going to ask mobile phone because everybody will raise the hand so in in laptop or desktop how many of you have an antivirus installed so practically the same number of hands are going up and how many of you have installed antivirus on a mobile phone so i can see 1 2 3 4 5 5 5 5 hands have gone up so in this forum which is you know i would say a knowledgeable and aware forum we are having probably less than 1/5 of the people who have antivirus in a mobile phone as compared to antivirus in a uh, in in a desktop so that's that's another uh, challenge which comes in the third challenge is the entire product so the entire product is designed for convenience which means that a lot of things are not visible to you for example in a wallet you don't see the url or the you know backend to which the wallet is connecting or the backend from where you're downloading the wallet if you are downloading a wallet from let us say uh, you know a, a, a app store how sh- how do you make sure that it is really the app which you intend to download it's not some imitation by some fraudster right <clears throat> because a lot of things are not visible in in a in a computer you see the url on top you see that there is an https signature there if you are uncomfortable you can click on that lock and figure out that it's really signed by a trusted authority and it's a trusted place but in wallet as such that is not visible you don't see it that that uh, openly so that's another challenge which comes in wallet because of the convenience lot of things are you know hidden so it's a mix of these uh, three uh, things i would say one is it's always on you know two it's a smaller form factor 
designed for convenience a lot of things are not available and three uh, because you know mobile phones are primarily a personal device only being used for a convenience factor the security mechanisms there are you know it's, it's an afterthought and as we just saw in this forum itself not many people have even an antivirus in the mobile phone thank you just reminds me that uh, your laptop and desktop even if you want to keep it on 24 by 7 bill gates shuts it down periodically for updates now <clears throat> again one of the uh, biggest risks we have is customer awareness about security it extends to a lot of other technologies that we use for example in in my old car i had to open the bonnet every day before uh, i start for work and check that everything is all right i have not opened the bonnet of my car for the last 5 years i do, in fact i don't know how to open it also so technology is all under the hood right the security also needs to be under the hood because the average user just as uh, 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 kunal demonstrated the average user is not focused on security he is focused on convenience so in implementing security govind question to you how can we ensure that security is implemented but transparent to the user all right and yet protecting the user see like uh, like kunal uh, mentioned out here the most important thing is obviously that you need to have a security product installed on all your endpoints be it your laptop be it your desktop uh, be it your uh, smartphone it could be an ios based smartphone that is from apple or it could be an android based smartphone you need to have a security product installed on uh, each of these endpoints that's very very important that's number one number two is because of the connectivity that uh, we have uh, today be it yourself be it your kids they are all they are all exposed to various things on the internet you know today i believe that my son probably knows more about what's happening on the internet than i would ever know and probably it's the same for all of you they are on various different kinds of social media they are on facebook they are on twitter they are on whatsapp and you don't know what's exactly happening behind the hoods so the most important thing obviously again is that whether you are browsing the any kind of a browser whether you are using whatsapp on your smartphones whether you are using facebook you need to very very closely monitor what kind of websites your kids are going to you need to monitor what kinds of conversation your kids are having at any point of time you need to monitor what kind of people they are talking to and there are security products available in the market we ourselves develop one which could be installed on uh, your mobile phones or your pcs to track all these things see tracking is not about uh, privacy in india we don't believe in privacy in united states probably a kid could go to a, a cop and say that my parents are uh, violating my privacy by putting some kind of a security product but in india we don't believe that we'll just say do thappad do aur karo ye that is the way that is the way we have been and that is the approach which has worked for us and if such a kind of approach has worked for us it is imperative it's very very important it's imperative Uh, that you need to force few things on to the endpoints that the kids are using to ensure that they are protected and your family is protected again digital wallets again uh, when you talk about uh, uh, today scenario that also brings about uh, newer challenges when it comes to security again for that like i mentioned you need to have an antivirus product there are so many advisories that come to you on your emails on a daily basis from banks do not do not disclose your pin do not disclose your cvv do not disclose uh, your passwords change your passwords often 100 things but i don't know how many how many of us actually go through it read it the exact status or exact incident the effect of an incident hap- that that we see or we that we notice we see it only when it happens to others we believe that it will never happen to us 
but sorry to say you just can't take this lightly in today's world you just can't take it lightly like he like patrick mentioned today what is happening under the bonnet you never come to know and trust me there are various ways and means by which i or any intelligent soul can push an app either to your smartphones or to your desktop without your knowledge or your awareness and you can't do anything about it you are com- you can be completely clueless https yes but i we we being in the security industry i have seen i have seen spoofed https sites which looks very very similar to a bank it looks like an original bank you see https you see a lock symbol you see everything that a bank says that okay look at all these things and you you are going to be secure but i have seen spoofed sites which look very similar to a bank and if you do anything on those sites everything is getting leaked out so it is like if i if 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 i very honestly feel i would say that all of you need to have the security products but at the back end we need stronger compliances we need stronger regulatory policies we need to have multi factor authentication when i'm just about few days back i used my mobile phone and i bought some stuff from singapore using my credit card details using my cbv but i did not get an otp and i was very surprised and shocked that the transaction could go through without an otp how could it happen i called up the bank obviously there was no response from there but then back end back end security plays a very 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 important role so you know sitting on this forum i would just request all the bankers that without an otp no transaction should go through whether be it a local transaction or an international transaction otp or a two factor authentication or multi factor authentication becomes very 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 important to ensure your security our security and everyone security so all these things put together probably would what give us a very secure world in which we can very easily transact and peacefully transact i would say thanks a lot okay one uh, information for all of you here only a website hosted in india an acquiring bank of india can enforce two factor authentication as mandated by rbi if your uh, intermediary is tencent no. he will he will not ask you for an otp all right so when you do your uh, e-commerce see that you do it either on an indian site like amazon.in amazon.com will not ask you for an otp all right and if you if you have a choice see that the intermediary that is the aggregator is an indian company like buildesk or uh, you know one of the indian acquirers and not somebody else all right okay thanks patrick <laughs> now of late we have here we have heard a lot of uh, news reports about banks being uh, hacked or credit card or debit card data being uh, um, leaked out stolen we have uh, even heard about uh, major ins- major banks losing money big time across the world we know it is criminal activity but um, i'll i'll come back to you govin how can how can banks guard against this is it continuous monitoring is it uh, hardening the devices can you tell us something about that yeah yeah sure i mean uh, this is from the cyber security today is an extremely complex field extremely complex complex to the to the to the factor that no single player can assure 100% hardening 100% security of the systems used inside banks like uh, patrick mentioned at the start of the conversation uh, it's like criminals are constantly on the lookout for ways and means to break technologies just about uh, uh, two days back we discovered a malware which could possibly break into atms and force the force the atm to probably spill out money i mean these kind of now there was no methodology yet uh, for that malware to get into the atm but mind you all the atms are connected to the respective banks via networks and any kind of any kind of compromise either on the bank side or the atm side could spell havoc 
so inside the banks inside the banks you know there are so many things happens that you are probably not aware of rtgs you might be doing rtgs in with, between bank from you to the uh, from between businesses and banks how does rtgs happens you might be doing swift transfers if you are doing international transfers for example where you have multiple central banks across the world connected to each other via financial uh, networks where uh, where hundreds of messages flow between banks and these are small messages trust me these are small nice sweet messages which possibly carry zeros to the extent that when you start counting the zeros you will not even know whether it it turns out to a million or a billion or a trillion those are the amounts of transaction that happens so what could be done what could be done inside the banks uh, in order to in order to ensure that we could provide as much safeguard and as much safety as possible that's the biggest question like you mentioned yes hardening is one thing hardening of the devices number one compliance regulatory compliance it becomes very 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 important ensuring that you follow security standards now i am not saying that following security standards is going to make a bank a banking network or the bank or the resources inside the bank safe but security standards ensure that at least the bare minimum things are are there in place and when you have security compliances you also have audits that means you have third party players who are coming to the bank very frequently very regularly ensuring that audits happen and an auditory report is provided to the cso or the cfo or the or the chief technology officer for example inside the banks uh, that is uh, one thing please ensure that no servers are connected to an open network where you know uh, where you have the entire internet or the entire cloud coming on to your on to your network very freely and easily that is the fourth thing ensure that there are no devices external devices should not and cannot ever be allowed into sensitive areas which basically uh, operate either the rtg software or the swift software five vulnerabilities you have on a daily basis there are criminals who are sitting there just to find out what kind of software has what kind of vulnerabilities and how to exploit those there are exploit mechanisms available on the available on the internet by which you can buy obviously security software firewalls audits you have uh, application white listing that you mentioned so many things hundreds of things you need to do even after doing 100 thing i'm not saying that it will be 100% secure because the thieves are always going to be one step ahead of the cops and that's going to be the story for today and for tomorrow but even in spite of the fact that we always play a catch up game with the thieves we need to do all these things to ensure that the banks are secure customers are secure and the transactions are secure at the end of the day thank, thank you thank you you have said this any amount of security cannot protect you i have always felt that uh, the to secure a computer the nut in front of the machine should be tightened <laughs> which brings me to user training how how um, aware are our bank users i'm not talking about the customer because we have to protect the customer but how how uh, well is a user trained in the banks and how what can we do to enhance that knowledge so that uh, the uh, there's no compromise at least on the bank side uh, so this has always been a a perennial issue i think with most of the banks uh, since many of you are bankers here maybe a small question for all of you to answer as well uh, how many of you have actually undergone uh, information security or a cyber security training within your company not many right so this has actually been a challenge uh, you know for for ages to come uh, for for a long time and for ages to come as as well the problem actually is the spread of the banks staff uh, the the kind of uh, exposure that they get to technology and the kind of interaction that the uh, the corporate team usually has with the banking staff who are sitting in the remotest corner of the of the uh, of india uh, we have seen number of cases in fact in my previous uh, 10 years as Uh, CISOs of uh, banks. Uh, we used to have very normal uh, sort of 
educational you know uh, awareness activities like for example having screen savers with security messages or um, having some classroom trainings once in a while but actually reaching the furthermost person the one who actually is your guy on the ground who's touching your data who's actually working in your systems has always been a challenge in life right so i think and 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 if you look at the fact that the hackers actually be, depend on this they know that the people on the ground are the ones who are not generally trained are not aware all it needs is a small phishing email to go to one of those guys there on the ground and he clicks on that email and the malware enters into your organization so this aspect of actually training your people in information security and cyber security specifically in today's world for example is extremely important right the there are a lot of uh, i think uh, novel ways by which companies normally do this these days there is a concept of having blue teams red teams approach uh, there are actually classroom trainings which are very innovative it's not the run of the mill uh, classroom sessions where they show you some few slides but they actually check on how much learning the person on the ground has actually gone through so there are companies for example also who offer you services like sending you a email and seeing and telling you how many of your employees have actually clicked on that emails right how many did not click and how many had the sense to actually understand it was a phishing email and report back to the incident management team that actually will define the success of your information security training program if you don't have your people coming back to you and telling you when they actually notice incidents or even suspect forget about noticing even suspecting incidents i think you will always have a challenge of security you may have the fanciest of technology solutions put in you will have your firewalls you will have your antivirus you will have everything but if the guy on the ground is not knowledgeable if he doesn't know which emails he should click and which he should not which website he is supposed to go and which he is supposed not to go you will always have a challenge with information security thank you uh, kural in your experience in consulting how aware are the top management in banks and other organizations maybe even government at the at the decision making level that really at the you know the the tone at the top can you can you tell us about uh, your experience in this sure uh, i will uh, share that so uh, i think l- let me uh, probably start with saying that uh, uh, when we are interacting with the organizations banks government etc you know what what i see what i used to see 3 4 years back and what we are seeing today uh, there is a shift there is a definite shift of uh, you know awareness the challenge in in security is that uh, being aware doesn't mean that one is acting you know because see uh, we we hear so many things and then what happens is that it is there somewhere in the mind but what overcomes is the pressing needs and one keeps it at the back so i think when we look at the top management as well as the you know other uh, agencies uh, uh, awareness i think it's it's coming in uh, somewhere and and especially in the bank side i think uh, you know one of the one of the biggest change management tool in banks as, as many times i say is a regulation so the when the regulation comes in there's no choice one has to do something so the regulation also has enforced a lot of uh, things there are requirements that boards have to meet discuss uh, about information security cyber security so because of that the degree of awareness has gone up uh, i think uh, where more needs to be done is to convert the degree of awareness to action because just degree of awareness would not help and uh, you know something which come to my mind is uh, 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 i was uh, going through a bbc program and uh, you know the people talking about that uh, about cyber security and one of the comment which came in and this has come in in various research is that uh, the amount of effort money which is being put in on security uh, especially in the asia pacific and including india is, is significantly lower than what is being done in western geographies us or western europe and and some of it is because uh, you know large crimes which uh, we see in the you know, public domain have happened there and so you know the the choice is not there and one has to really go about addressing uh, so to that extent uh, 
you know, as I said, the, the, the action on the cyber security, because awareness is one part, the second part is action. There, uh, you know, a lot more needs to be done. Uh, and and uh, I will not say nothing is happening, but I think a lot more needs to be done. So India is one of the few countries which has enacted the IT Act and uh, has be, sort of been updating it. Also set up, uh, identified the critical information infrastructure uh, and uh, started initiatives to protect that and so on. Yeah. One of the key challenges that we face uh, in the Indian environment is the security products they are all from MNCs we hardly have any indigenous security products we are there um, yes <laughs> <laughs> so, so similarly there is a serious lack of uh, skilled professionals in security uh, I always found that uh, most of the fresh graduates from engineering colleges after computer science, most of them want to join an IT services company, but don't want to go get into security, right? So how, how can we attract talent and keep it and develop indigenous technologies for uh, insecurity? Patrick, I believe if you ask me in my in my years of experience, I would say that uh, we screen about uh, 3,000, 4,000 resumes probably in a week. And after screening about 3,000 to 4,000 resumes in a week, we hardly get one person who could be capable to be, who, whom we find capable enough to be trained and pushed ahead. So today, information technology has become like a bhaji market. Every Tom, Dick and Harry wants to get into only one thing, computers. They will do civil engineering, they will go into computers. They will do textile engineering, they will get into computers. So every, you know, you can't, you, I mean, when we, when we see the, when we see the capabilities of such people, I'm, it's like, it's, it's shocking. It's shockingly bad. So, when this kind of a scenario is there, it becomes very, very difficult to really get good people also. And once we get good people, majority of the people are driven to service-oriented companies because half of the people are okay sitting on the bench. You know, what, what's the difference? What, what, uh, it's fine, it's good. So, with that kind of an approach... You know, I'll give you a simple, small example. We had a, we had a two-year experienced guy who had come for an interview for a position of a C developer. So he said that he had a, he had quite a good experience in some company uh, uh, writing programs and all. So uh, one of our interview guys, he just interviewed while interviewing. He said, "Why don't you write a write a small uh, uh, a small loop?" Uh, which will print numbers from 1 to 50. Okay, just a small loop. How will you do it? So this guy, he sat down for 15 minutes and then he wrote 50 lines. Print 1, print 2, print 3, print 4, print 5, and print 50. <laughs> and I was like, what, what? What kind of time am I wasting on these kind of people? And what are, what is the kind of people that we are developing? And these are the very people who probably fudge their resumes. You have hundreds of sites, websites, you know, which basically makes you a good resume with terminologies which probably half the people won't understand. And these are the people who, who also go to United States because... They have a telephonic interview, and when telephonic interview happens, there's a third person who's probably giving an interview like your Munna Bhai, sitting there. And I don't know where we are going. You know, it's a very sad state, unfortunately. So out of 4,000 resumes, I don't even get one person. It's a sheer waste of our time. It's a sheer waste of energy. And I don't know what, to, what advice to give to people that why, are you, why the hell are you getting into IT when you are not even interested in any such thing? So 
it's like once you get into a product company, product company has its own challenges because we work on IPRs. You know, we develop IPRs, we develop uh, uh, patents, and that's what we are good at. And like Microsoft, for example, and we are not like service companies. And then retaining them and cha training them and cha and working with them. And once they are good, yes, they they do stay back because there are very few companies in India which basically are into products which are with developed technologies. And very few handful of companies, and most of them are in the West. And obviously, India is a good place to stay in. And obviously, if, I, if somebody wants to go and sit in a bench in United States or in United Kingdom, I can't stop them at the end of the day. But if their interest is not veered towards systems programming or operating systems, I can't do anything about it. But that is the state right now. That's and actually, so that's a big challenge the country faces now. The estimate is something like... Uh, 500,000 skilled professionals required for uh, uh, cyber security. I don't know where we are going to get them, mainly because uh, cyber security is not cool. Hmm? So, uh, yeah. So, you know, I think one, a couple of things which I would say. Uh, one is, uh, uh, you know, finally everything said and done, uh, it boils down to law of economics. And, and that is where I think we need to all focus on, is that uh, what are we really trying to uh, do? Uh, you know, I've been in the consulting industry for the last 18 years, and uh, I can tell you not 9 out of 10, but maybe 99 out of 100 times, the most important focus remains how do we drive the cost down? Right? Uh, it's not about how do we drive the value up, because if, if you are, you know, if as an organization, whether the organization is buying or as a consultant I'm, I'm supplying, uh, there could be two broad views. How can I drive maximum value or how can I drive minimum cost? And uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, most of us uh, have been graduating towards how can I drive minimum cost. And if it is minimum cost, then, uh, of course, law of economics will come into play and we will have whatever we have, and which, you know, I think uh, we were just uh, discussing about. So I think, one, that realization has to come. Uh, and along with that, I think another thing which is important is that if something goes wrong, what happens? So uh, I was talking to one of uh, the CIOs of a very large bank some time back, and, you know, we were talking about what should be done on the information security policy, et cetera, et cetera. And he said, you know, Kunal, fine, we are discussing all this. Tell me one person in my organization or anywhere else who has been put behind the bars because something has gone wrong in security. If somebody misuses a password or somebody does something, where is the action coming in? So I think, you know, we need to become serious on that. That's, I would say, in a normal course of thing. Two is, I would, I would really uh, think that to kickstart anything, there has to be incentivization, and which is where maybe, you know, government needs to come in and, and maybe give some incentive, you know. A lot of reason why the Indian IT industry rose, the, and whichever way it has risen, is because government at some points of time for a long, long, long period has supported, has given tax incentives, has given various incentives. We are looking at various, you know, Startup India and all these programs. So maybe, you know, at, at that forum, and especially, you know, uh, uh, we're both of you here uh, being somewhere related to that, can some push be enabled that a niche market uh, with more incentives is brought in on cybersecurity? I think we need that as a country. Yeah, sure. So just a couple of points. Uh, basically, in the, uh, in the earlier organizations where I worked as well, the challenge always has been to find very skilled information security people. Uh, traditionally, it has been people in the IT field who wanted to have a career change and they move into IT, or they have become redundant in IT, so then they need some place to go and they get into information security, right? So this has always been the case till the last few years, few years, and information security was not really thought of as a very, uh, you know, sort of uh, sort of something which you would look forward to kind of thing, and primarily because the focus was not, not there. But nowadays, with the recent uh, threats and the hacks that are happening in the banks. There is a lot of focus on getting skilled information security people, and it is becoming a career objective now. Institutes now, actually, who have started two years of uh, training programs purely on cybersecurity. There are some institutes who offer full-time six months course only on cybersecurity. So we are seeing the change coming about. Uh, so I think in the next few months and a few years, we should actually see this skill set building up and, and developing as well. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we have covered the situation in the country fairly well the troubles that we face, the shortages of uh, skilled manpower and then the opportunities for training and so on. 
So I leave the floor now to the audience. We can take two questions before we close. Two questions. Can somebody give them a mic? Yeah, I just want to ask the panelists out here. Um, this is I'm just I'm talking my personal experience. One one day one of my cards got lost. Now look at the way how it happens. You call the bank first. Which language you want? Then, uh, what is the query you got? After that, all of our customers are busy. Kindly hold on. Now here I'm bothered. If the card is misused, what happens then? So by the time you could resolve the issue, it took me nearly 10 minutes to actually get through holding the line. Now, so in fact, even the banks don't have a proper system of addressing this at the most critical moment. I don't know why no one could even think of maybe even as an e-scan. You could have some like a hotline number. Press that number, and immediately account gets blocked. How simple and how difficult is that? A very simple application, but still no one can think about it. So what happens then? Then they could call me back and ask what happened. You blocked your account there. That's an advantage I face now. So this sort of simple things also we don't have, and that's a problem. If you and this actually happened with me, so I was wondering what happens then for so many people who lose their cards every day, or the accounts get compromised now. So. You're right. None of us like uh, IVR. None of us like IVR. So in, in they are now saying this uh, 3A principle: an American will lose his job to a nation, and a nation will lose his job to automation. All right. So IVR is supposed to be automation, but it's not really. Right. So I think it's quite easy to automate that process and make it easy for the users. Are the banks listening here? question no questions oh hi um i'm davis uh i'm from a technology company so uh in the initial discussion we were uh, mentioning about uh, the approaches of security and the end user that the end user need to be aware that definitely the education need to be there and on the point like uh antivirus that uh, Everybody should have a antivirus in the software or on the mobile phones, like desktop and everything. But uh, is it really practical in 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 a, in a world like uh, uh, India? A uh, lot of people using uh, Android, loin phones, smartphones is being so popular. Uh, is the approach should be the other way around? That uh, tackle the security in the back end uh, with a uh, lot of intelligence. Uh, like uh, I was re recently reading about uh, how machine learning can be use a data driven process where the security can be enhanced in the enterprise than you giving the challenge to the customer so can banks uh, can recently think about how a data driven process can be applied to enhance the security in the back end than giving the challenge to customers can i say something here uh, what's your name david david <laughs> okay uh, let's assume you take your smartphone is a is a it's a mobile product. We call it mobile product. Sorry. So what happens if you take the smartphone to another country? What happens there? So, yes, you are right. Ba if you secure the backends very nicely, very clearly, uh, very concisely, precisely, and you are in India and backends are secured, you are going to be secure. The moment you walk out out of the geography of the country and you go to some other country and you are connecting to some other provider, telco, for example the entire thing goes cra comes crashing down so it is very important that you secure your endpoint as much as possible and rest of the security which you cannot control has to be provided to the backend or has to be dependent on the backend that's the way it has to be you can never say that i am not going to do anything on my endpoint and everything has got to be done by the backend sorry that's like you know taking the responsibility on putting it on somebody else's head, which is not going to work because ultimately you are the loser. They are not going to lose it. So I, I will just uh, say a couple of things here. One is, uh, you know, there are a lot of things which are happening in the back end. But, you know, the, w what is the whole objective? We are all trying together to beat that, um, you know, malicious guy or the perpetrator. And for that, both things have to happen. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of you have experienced that if you go outside the country and transact, certainly you are asked more questions. If you do a larger transaction, the bank many times even calls you. Right? So it's not that backend is not happening and there's a lot of things which are happening. 
uh, companies like Google are, uh, as their stated objective is to not even have password. Why should I ask password? I will recognize the individual. So, you know, those kind of things are there. Having said that, you cannot only look at backend. The front end has to be looked at because in security, the simple point is the weakest link is what the perpetrator needs to break. So, you know, if, you have, if there are 100 things and 99 are secured, but that one is in your mobile phone, then that brings in the risk. Actually, talking of backends, two years ago, nobody thought about, uh, thought about the building toilets. Today, thanks to Swachh Bharat, everybody is building toilets, right? So we need to have a Swachh Cyber Bharat also. Basic hygiene. All of us must follow certain basic hygiene, teach our children at home, in school, all right? So that's how we build a clean society, right? Backend, yes, certainly something will happen at the enterprise level, but at the individual level also, you must wash your hands before you eat, right? Right, on this note, I think we'll close. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much for that interesting session.